you so much for your kind introduction. Um, I will ask Ohio to make me a host so that we can upload our PowerPoint. In the meantime, I, you know, uh, Duncan and I uh, can say a quick hello. Um, first, you know, I want to say that um, it is such a privilege to be with you guys. Thank you again to the Phenomics Law Group for inviting us. And I, you know, all the organizers for putting this together. I do really want to um, give a shout out to Nsiko Arnold, who um, contacted me through LinkedIn and uh, persisted um, to ensure that this becomes a reality. Um, you know, it's a privilege to be sharing the, the, the stage actually with Duncan Kiera, who is in fact my boss um, at the bank uh, and my co-professor at the Washington College of Law. Um, Again, I would say that it is so much of a privilege to be with you guys who are both the current and future legal minds of the African continent. As a general guiding principle, um, there are a couple of things. Um, because Professor Kara and I teach at the law school, this feels like a classroom to us. And we've talked about it and our process, both at uh, the Washington College of Law and what we would like to do here is to engage with you right away. Um, we want to hear as many voices as possible. We will ask Vasora to uh, moderate the chat room. If we ask questions, we ask that students, we'll prioritize students in the first hour. So um, we'll ask students to raise their hands if we ask questions, um, you know, and uh, Vasora, you can ask a, a particular person to um, respond to a question that we pose. Um, and please, you know, try to ensure that um, the, the people who raise their hands that are selected, you know, uh, people who are representative of, of, of the people here um, across the continent. So that's what we'll do in the first hour. The second thing that I'd like to say is that um, Professor Fernanda, who is actually the director of our program, who I believe is also um, online with us today, um, who is a, a comparative law expert, at the Washington College of Law, shared an article with um, Duncan and I, um, which was really the uh, grocious lecture from last year um, that was given by one of uh, your editors, uh, Professor James Gatti. And in that uh, lecture, he really talked about the third world approach to international law. And one of the things that he challenges um, academics uh, and practitioners to do was to um, foreground, foreground uh, what he describes as, you know, uh, thick descriptions and local knowledge um, against what is deemed to be, um, I believe, you know, models, you know, abstract models and universal assumptions. So he says, you know, we have to go beyond the exclusive emphasis on black letter law. And so I want you to understand that in the first hour, as Professor Kara and I, I engage with you, as much as we are trying to, in many ways, present to you something that will seem like the black letter of the law, we are conscious of this um, challenge, and which is what we're hoping we will do with the second hour. But in order to, in many ways, foreground uh, local knowledge, it is important to also have the background. So what we're doing with the first hour is really to present the background. Um, so those are sort of, um, you know, uh, housekeeping um, comments that I want to make at this point. Um, Professor Kara, I don't know if you want to add anything else before we get started and I'll share the screen in the meantime. I mean, I'll share the screen with the uh, PowerPoint in the meantime. It's very to say um. hello. Thank you, Professor Nwogu, and, and good day, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to, um, to be here um, and to, uh, to have a chance uh, to, um, to engage with you all um, on an area that I think is uh, Professor Nwogu and I are very passionate about. Um, this is actually the second time I'm uh, um, um, doing something with the Afronomics um, group. I've actually... I had the pleasure of uh, of uh, doing an indaba with Professor Gavi, who Professor Nogu just mentioned, where we talked about one of the financing uh, um, vehicles that we use um, um, in in the international finance space to um, to raise financing for development. Um, and so it's it's a pleasure to do this again in a, a slightly different format. Um, 
Um, as may be apparent to you, uh, Professor Mugundai, um, in addition to being um, uh, in academia, are, are also practitioners. And, and I, I hope that you, you will get, um, you will see the intersection of those two areas. And when I mean practitioners, I mean we work in, 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 financial, in, a, in financial institutions. Um, and so I, hopefully you will see uh, a balance of, of both the, uh, the theoretical uh, underpinnings of the work that we do and its practical application as well. Um, um, and just one final thing, of course, uh, just to mention, since we are lawyers, that a lot, you know, the views that we will present, particularly on the World Bank, um, are our own views. They are not necessarily the official views of the institution, um, but we will share with you as candidly as we can um, uh, our own thoughts as to various aspects of the work that we do uh, in response, in particular to the questions that you ask. So with that, thank you again. Um, and I guess we can get started. Um, uh, Professor Nogo, you may want to go again to presentation view on the, okay. uh, on the PowerPoint. So I'm just gonna take you through the roadmap of what we're gonna be talking about, um, what seems to be the next, um, I guess, uh, 45 minutes. Um, as a general matter, uh, we will start with um, the law of IFIs and the World Bank um, in terms of an introduction. And why are we doing that? Uh, because this is a case study of the World Bank. Um, and the idea is that the bank facilitates right, the uh, implementation of development uh, in a legal sense. But it not only facilitates it, the bank itself is a structure of development. So an understanding of the bank as a structure and as a facilitator of development is important. But what we want to do is to situate it. We are talking to a legal audience. What the typology of the World Bank, what are the bounds? What are the limits of the bank? What, what, is, what is this animal? What, um, what is the nature uh, of the World Bank? So we will situate this in the context of the World Bank as an international organization. And in doing that, we'll explore elements of his constituent documents. We shared some reading materials for you guys in preparation for today. So we're not gonna look through the entire document. Obviously there is a lot of intersections. Um, there are intersections with respect to uh, the entirety of the constituent documents, but ultimately we want to just point out some salient aspects that will be relevant for our discussions today. And then after that, Professor Kara will take us through the sources of upstream financing and the structures of our, basically the instruments of our downstream financing. It's just to give you, as we mentioned earlier, the background of the, you know, what we would deem to be sort of, you know, uh, factual background that you can then, um, or together we can collectively critique, but also um, look at within the context of um, Africa's development um, more generally, basically to ask the question of what um, the role of the World Bank ought to be in the context of African development. So um, in class, I always begin with what I believe to be the most effective question in a classroom, um, but I also believe that it is the most effective question in the larger world. And that is the question, why? Um, because uh, I believe that if we understand the why of anything, so, for example, if we understand why African development, if we explore why the World Bank, um, you know, then we, we, if, we, if we do understand the question why we become equipped with the tools for re-evaluation, with the tools for kicking the tires of our own inherited assumptions, the tools for reformation, um, for changing the how of anything so that we actually can be responsive to the needs of the time. So because this session is a study on the World Bank, we will begin with why the World Bank? Um, you know, what is the World Bank? Why is it? Um, should it be relevant um, on the African continent and in African development? So the bank is an IFI, it's an international financial institution, but it's not just any financial institution, right? We've talked about the fact that it is a legal structure of development, um, but the kind of IFI it is, right? If we were to say, how can we distinguish this IFI from say Citibank? Because in terms of the ordinary meaning of the word, Citibank can be deemed to be an international, uh, international financial institution because it's a financial institution operating in the international 
um, ecosystem. So what distinguishes it? And to help us figure that out, we go into sort of some of the um, frameworks for understanding the types of institutions that we tend to think of um, the World Bank as belonging to, uh, which is uh, a typology of that we think of as international organizations, right? Um, international organizations are um, organizations that we can type in different ways. We can type them in the context of their functions, in the terms of their structure, um, you know, in, in terms of their, the, the, the nature of his membership, how it is created. So when we think about IOs, we think about social constructs. These are organizations that are put together. They, they are not organic, they, you know, they're not biological. So they're social constructs that are created by entities for a purpose. But in this case, they are public rather than private. So created by their member states um, for a specific purpose. And in the context of a World Bank, the bank has a specific mandate, a specified mandate that is technical in nature. So it is not, you know, for example, to distinguish between the bank and the UN. The UN has a broader mandate and is also one that is more political than it is technical, um, um, as opposed to the bank. In terms of is, um, you know, uh, openness and closeness, we can talk about the fact that the bank is more open as a global institution than let's say the African Development Bank as a regional institution. So what we mean by that, or OPEC, right, as, as uh, um, a group of countries that are petroleum exporting. So that it's more limited in terms of its membership, either by region or by the thing that it does. Um, with the bank, you have um, an open structure where theoretically um, any sovereign, any, any, any state can actually seek to join, uh, join the bank. And it is created by um, its members. Uh, so again, when we talk about international organization typologies, we're talking about um, an organization created by sovereigns who have uh, the capability, the legal capability to bring about the existence of organizations using a treaty structure. So when we talk about the constituent documents of the World Bank, when we talk about um, the articles of agreement, that's basically AKA the constituent documents of the World Bank, we're talking about a document that has a treaty status, right? Because it has um, been given that status by the member states who have um, um, established um, the, the organization. And, yes. Sorry, are you trying to move the slides? Um, no, not yet. I'm still working yes, through the, the, yeah, the typology. So in terms of the IO as well, you, you is it moving? Are the slides moving? No. Okay. That's why I'm asking. You were st you're still on the cover. You're still on the on the cover. You're still on the oh, cover. Oh, I shouldn't. Oh, I shouldn't. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. So, um, so what do you do? You now see the roadmap. Yes, yes, yes sure enough. Okay, no, sure. so I've gone through the roadmap <laughs> and I am now on this slide. Okay, good to know. Thanks so much for pointing that out because um, it seems like the two screens, I'm, well, I'm working with two screens here, but it seems like um, the two screens uh, are not actually working in tandem. So that's good to know. Thanks, Professor Kara, for pointing that out. Okay, so here we were going through the um, IO topologies. So we've talked about the fact that it is... Um, a multilateral organization established by its member states through the use of a treaty, on the basis of a treaty, and is also one that has uh, a particular um, process for decision making. It is one that commands legal personality in the ecosystem, in, in terms of the international ecosystem, and that there are protections, there are privileges and immunities that it has in order to be able to fulfill its functions in its member state jurisdictions. So, you keep these in mind as we go into um, looking at um, the constituent documents of the World Bank. But what do we actually mean when we talk about the World Bank? What, what does that mean, right? Um, the World Bank, you know, people use that appellation a lot, but that is actually not a legal entity. The World Bank is not a legal entity. Um, rather, the World Bank is a, a name or an appellation for two legal entities um, combined, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development 
and the International Development Association, IBRD and IDA. So as lawyers, as you know, the devil is in the details. It's important to know, you know, when we are engaging with any of these institutions, what we're talking about, because the terms that may apply to them, um, the issues, the limits, the mandate, um, you know, may be slightly different. Um, so when we talk about the World Bank, we are talking about IBRD and IDA, as we call it here. Um, but the World Bank, is um, you know make be consisting of these two institutions actually um, are part of a larger group of organizations um, called the World Bank Group. So it's important that as you you know discuss with people when people are referencing the World Bank Group that is distinct from the World Bank, um, and that those two terms World Bank Group and and, and World Bank really are an appellation for specific and identified legal institutions. So the legal institutions of the World Bank Group are the ones that you see on the screen. IBRD established in 1944 in the wake of or towards the end of World War II. You have the International Finance Corporation, the International Development Association, um, basically at the cusp of the decolonization period, IDA was created. You have ICSID, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, and MIGA, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency which is the latest um, established in 1988. So again, distinction between World Bank Group and World Bank and what the legal entities that actually consist of these uh, organizations are. Um, and so when we look at the salient features of, of the World Bank specifically, so we've talked about the IO typologies and rational organization types. Um, so you start to see how we're able to identify where the World Bank fits into IOS, right? When we're looking at its constituent documents, the, the document that created these organizations, that when we are saying that this is a global economic development institution with a specified mandate, we talk about its article, um, Article 1, which speaks to its purpose, what it can do, what are its powers, what is its mandate, out of which flows his mission. And we'll take a closer look at that shortly. Um, we talk about um, whether we're talking about Article 410 in the IBRD Articles of Agreement or Article 56, Article 5, Section 6, in the IDA Articles of Agreement, you, you start to see um, the language of political prohibition, which is one of the um, references we provided to you. And why did I put that there? It's something that in a sense create the bounds. So in a sense, Article 1 puts together the powers, but there are limits to those powers. And the limits to those powers, um, you know, one of those limits or a key limit, a salient limit is the Article 10, um, Article uh, 4, 10 in IBRD and Article uh, um, 5, 6 in IDA, which is the political prohibition article that basically is saying that the bank cannot engage or make decisions on the basis of the political status of, of the members in which it's in, engaging with. Um, so the bank engages for economic reasons and not for political, uh, for political reasons. So, so that's a, a sort of limit. Um, Article 2.1 speaks to who can be a member of IBRD or IDA. So for both constituent documents, in their, um, in, the, in their articles, but in Article 2.1, speak to the fact that, you know, here are those who can be members of this institution. And, you know, uh, you, you probably take a, a good look at that. And, um, and can someone tell me um, who can be a member of, um, of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development? Did anyone do some of the readings that we provided for, for today? So, um, Professor, if you can, you know, call on someone who, so you can raise your hand if you know who can be members of IBRD and, and speak up and let us know. Okay, if anybody has the answer, um, you can just lift your hand up or put in the chat and I'll be able to select you. Okay. 
in the inst okay it doesn't seem like um i don't see any hands raised i'm sorry yeah there's so. a hand up from sarah mwale okay go ahead sarah hi um so yes um according to article where well, should be yes it says uh membership is open to all the members of the international monetary fund the imf um imf as well as are uh, open to other members that are uh, they've agreed to membership of the bank i don't know if i've gotten that one correct but i think that's absolutely. what i read yes Sarah, you are absolutely right. It says in order to be a member of IBRD, you have to be a member of the IMF. And we'll talk about that and why ultimately the IMF and the World Bank are deemed to be the Bretton Woods or the twin institutions or, or you know, of the Bretton Woods agreement. So it's the Bretton Woods institutions. And when we look at the IDA articles, we see that in order to be a member of IDA, do you, do you also know why, um, who can be members of the, who can be members of, of the International Development Association. Same article 2.1, right? Yeah. So Professor, you have- Professor Nwogu, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you may need to speak closer to the mic because you are cutting in and out um, yes. and, and you keep fading. Um, right. So we can hear you clearly Thank at some you. sections and then others it's, it's, it cuts out too. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. That's very helpful. Um, so ultimately, when you also look at the IDA articles, it speaks to the same sort of language. Basically, in order to be a member of the International Development Association, you have to be a member of IBRD, which ultimately means that you have to be a member of, of the IMF, um, given the requirements for um for membership with IBRD. So um, here in this slide, you start to see in the constituent documents, the process for decision-making, the mandate of the organization, who can be members of this organization. Um, it speaks to you know, the, the nature of the operations of, of the organization, what they can and cannot do. It speaks to the legal personality, um, you know, whether they can or cannot contract. Um, in the international system, it speaks to the privileges and immunities, you know, some of the protections that allows uh, the institutions to um, conduct their activities. Um, but, you know, one thing to note, as we've already talked about, is that IDA is legally and financially distinct from IBRD. Professor Kara will take us through the streams of financing so that you are actually able to understand how IDA is financed and, and how IBRD um, is financed. But ultimately, even though these are two legally separate institutions, um, financially um, um, also funded differently, um, both of them are administered by the same management and staff um, under very basically near identical administrative and operational policies. That is to say, when you see someone who says they work at IBRD, um, it's absolutely um, likely uh, that they are also basically um, um, either staff. So, um, so that's something that's something to keep in mind. Um, and so, uh, as we mentioned before, IBRD was established in 1944 together with the IMF. Um, the initial mission of uh, these institutions was to assist in the reconstruction and economic development of its member states after World War II. Um, and in fact, at that point, the very first country to receive um, support, financial support um, from the bank was, um, can anyone guess? Would anyone know this? This is just a random fact. Um, so it's not, it wasn't part of your reading or anything. Um, but anyway, the first country to, um, to receive financial support from, uh, from the bank was the, the government of France. So again, ultimately, this was targeted towards the development um, or the reconstruction and economic development um, of, of uh, European countries uh, for the most part after World War II. But ultimately, as um, the Marshall Plan from the US um, began to take root, um, the, the mandate of the IBRD um, started to dwindle in terms of the fact that you know, the, the reconstruction of Europe was you know, coming along. 
And so there was a need to repurpose uh, this institution. And um, in the 70s, there was a repurposing of the interpre uh, interpretation. So the language of the articles um, did not change. And we can talk about this in the second hour. It did not change, but it was reinterpreted um, towards poverty reduction. As you know, when we look at the articles, we can, we can see how we were able to do this. Um, and of course, you have IDA, which is deemed to be the concessional lending arm. And Professor Kara would show you what that means and why, why IDA is deemed concessional when we look at the financing structures. Um, established in 1960, again, coinciding with the decolonization period um, in Africa and Asia to really support um, some of these countries as, as they were beginning to build up, uh, to build up their economies. And so when we look at IDA purposes very closely, I just want to have you take a look at some of the areas where we have um, bolded um, the, the mandate of these organizations. So keep this in mind as we start to talk about Africa's development and where does the World Bank fit in, um, in terms of Africa's development in the 21st century. So if the purpose of IBRD is to facilitate the investment of capital for productive purposes, if it is to promote private foreign investment by means of guarantee or participation in loans when capital is not available on reasonable terms, um, when it is to encourage international investment for the development of the productive resources of members, right? For the productive resources of members, to assist in raising productivity, the standard of living and conditions of labor. Um, for the IDA purposes, here it says to promote economic development, increase productivity and raise living standards. And you can see that that language very much mirrors what we see in the IBRD purposes, right? But here it limits it in some ways to the less developed areas of the world, including within the association's membership. So take a look at, you know, closer look at that language to raise the living standards in less developed areas of the world included, sorry, included within the association's membership um, to provide fin um, finance to meet their uh, important, so prioritization to meet their important development requirements on terms more flexible and bear less heavily on the balance of payments. Um, than those of conventional loans, thereby furthering the development of objective of the IBRD. So in a sense, IDA created to bear out the development objectives of, of the IBRD. So when we look at these, um, keep them in mind as we think about what should be, what ought to be the role of the World Bank in Africa's development, which is something that all of us can creatively brainstorm on Given its mandate, what are the bounds of these institutions, you know, um, and also to think about it very differently. So if we're thinking of this third world approach to international law, um, there are arguments that show that the notion, the ideas that brought about the Bretton Woods institutions were actually not necessarily Western, right? That some of these ideas began um, beyond the borders of, of Western countries. So if you were at the table, trying to repurpose these institutions, trying to reinterpret their purposes for the current time. Given the language that we have here, how would we go about it? So I'll pause on that for now and hand over to Professor Kiara to take us through the uh, sources of upstream financing, as well as uh, the instruments for downstream financing to give a context, to give a little bit more of the texture for the purposes that we have just identified. And with that, I'll hand over to Professor Kiara. Um, thank you very much, Professor Nwogu. Um, I'm gonna try and do in about 10 minutes what will typically take um, three weeks um, of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of lectures to, to get through in detail. But I, I don't want you to be overwhelmed, I think, by what you'll see in terms of uh, you know, the, the the financing, upstream and downstream financing. This the intention here is just to give you a flavor and, and a very high level overview of, of how these institutions finance themselves and channel that financing onto our clients. Um, 
And, and as Professor Nogu noted at the beginning, um, you know, the World Bank, and here I'm talking about IBRD and IDA, are not Citibank, right? And maybe just a little test to see how many people are actually paying attention. In, what are a couple of the different the differences between a Citibank and, and the World Bank from what you've just heard in the last 20 minutes or so? And again, I'll ask Vesora if anybody puts up their hand or wants to respond in the chat. A couple of the differences between those institutions. Um, if anybody has the answer, you can either raise your hand or put it in the chat. I do not know us to be this shy. So there must be something going on, either it's late or early. Going once. Going twice. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll try one more time at some point and see if we get... Uh, um, um, if anybody is willing to uh, to uh, um, to respond, but um, as Professor Nogu noted, and and I think what, uh, somebody responded, uh, I think it was Sarah, to the question of you know who the members of uh, the World Bank are, um, of IBRD and IDA. It, it it's it's these are institutions that are owned by by sovereigns, by our sovereign members, right? Unlike Citibank, which is uh, a listed. A company owned by private investors, right? Which is one of the major differences. And another is that because the IBRD and IDA are international organizations, there was a reference uh, uh, by Professor Nogu to the privileges and immunities that they enjoy by virtue of their being owned by sovereigns. Unlike Citibank, which will be a regulated entity in the jurisdictions in where it operates. But there are very strong similarities, nevertheless, between IBRD and IDA, as we will see shortly, and a city bank. Because IBRD in particular was actually set up as a bank. It finances itself like a bank. It finances itself in much the same way that a city bank will finance itself. And, and that's why we see a reference here to um, both equity and bond issuances. IBRD has share capital which its shareholders, sovereign members again, have subscribed to. But in addition to that share capital, IBRD is going to go out to the capital markets and issue bonds. Uh, and it's one of the largest, it's actually the largest international financial institution bond issuer uh, in the world. Um, and issues in the range of between 50 and $60 billion worth of, um, of, uh, of bonds um, in any given year all over the world. And that's how it finances uh, the um, um, loans um, that it provides to its recipient uh, member, uh, to its recipient member countries, by a mix of both uh, borrowed funds from the capital markets and um, um, uh, equity that it has um, received from uh, its shareholders when they subscribe to the shares issued by. Um, by, um, by the bank, by IBRD. IDA, on the other hand, was set up um, about 15 years after IBRD had been set up because it became quite clear um, that because of the financing model that IBRD uses, where it is borrowing funds to raise, uh, to, to on lend to its clients, meaning that it, it is on lending those funds at commercial rates of interest, that while that model works for um, financing projects in countries that can generate a return that would enable them to pay back the loans that it took from IBRD so that IBRD in turn can repay um, its bondholders, that wouldn't work for um, um, less developed countries. It wouldn't work for financing what are considered the soft sectors, right? That um, education, for example, or health, that may not be necessarily sectors that would generate the kind of return that would be, uh, that would help uh, repay um, uh, borrowed funds. So IDA was set up as a, um, 
uh, as a concessional vehicle, as Professor Nogu mentioned earlier, that is funded and has been funded for the, the vast majority of its existence through uh, a replenishment process where every three years, donors will come together to put money into the kitty um, so that IDA can provide highly concessional oh. financing to its recipient countries, right? And by highly concessional financing here, we're talking about interest-free loans or um, um, uh, grants, funds that do not have to be paid back. And for the vast majority of its operations, for its time in existence, it has been, uh, it has used that financing model. Every three years, donors will come and put money into, into the hat as it were. That changed um, um, about uh, six years ago when it, um, it, became, uh, it became clear that the demands, the development needs of, our, uh, of, of its recipient countries um, far outstripped the available resources. And we needed to find additional ways of raising financing to help meet um, those uh, financing demands. Ida, as it turned out, had accumulated a fairly large, very large balance sheet uh, um, over the years because of this constant replenishment. And so a hybrid financing model was developed where uh, Ida would continue to have donors putting funds into the hat, but Ida would in turn also go out and borrow money uh, in the capital markets, issue bonds as well, which it had always been able to do as a legal matter, but as a financing, um, I'll ask somebody to mute. I think there may be somebody who's unmuted. Thank you. Uh, um, um, it, became, uh, it became clear that um, by, by mixing, uh, blending as it were, both the concessional resources it receives from its uh, members through the replenishment process and by going out and borrowing resources in the capital markets, that it could increase significantly the volume of resources that it makes available to its client countries. And so um, for, the, uh, for the last um, um, four, um, four years or so, um, um, this is the model that has been used um, um, to raise financing for, um, for IDA. Um, and it has almost doubled the size of the resources it can provide over any given period as a result of this uh, hybrid financing model. There is a third pool of funds that 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 um, that um, um, uh, the World Bank uh, is able to tap uh, through what we call trust funds, which are financial arrangements where donors uh, put money uh, into a, into a, into a pool. Um, what we call either uh, uh, single donor trust funds, where it's just one donor, or multi donor trust funds, that they can then. Um, um, agree with the bank will be used to finance specific um, uh, activities in a specific sector or in a specific geographical location. Um, commercial interlude. Um, and um, um, those have also generated a significant amount of resources uh, over the years. Um, and we'll see in a, in, a, in a few slides just what the volume is that we're talking about there. Um, if we could move to the next slide. Um, I'll just give you um, an, an illustration of um, uh, graphic illustration of what um, the, the, the equity base um, uh, IBRD's business model looks like. Um, as I mentioned, it's 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 funded. IBRD funds itself by a mix of both borrowed and um, uh, borrowed funds and, and and equity. But what is interesting about IBRD's equity base, and you will find this replicated in most other um, international financial institutions, certainly the regional development banks, the Asian Development Bank and the Africa Development Bank, is that its capital, its shareholding, um, is divided into what we call callable capital and paid in capital. So for every share of IBRD that a shareholder owns, a portion of it is paid in and the bulk of it is callable. Callable meaning, callable meaning that in the event that IBRD is unable to make payments on its bonds, it can ask the shareholders who have promised to, to pay in 
that share of its share of, of its shareholding, it can request them to make that payment in cash so that it can meet its own obligations. And the ratio between the paid in portion and the callable portion is about six to 94. So if we took, uh, if we said that each share is $100, only $6 is actually paid in, $94 is callable. And so what you see in this, in, on the pie chart here, is that um, the, while um, um, IBRD has a share capital that is in excess of uh, 300, um, um, or close to $300 uh, billion, dollars, only $28 billion of that is actually paid in. And um, the rest, the 269 is, is, is callable. And it has been able, I, IBRD has been able to, to, to provide significant volumes of financing effectively based on that portion of paid in capital, the 28 billion, because that, it is that, that that supports the borrowings effectively that um, 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 IBRD makes to finance activities that it, uh, that it finances in its recipient countries. It's, it's, it's a highly leveraged model. Again, very similar to what you'd see in a commercial bank, somewhat more conservative, but still a leverage model. Um, um, and, and, and useful to remember that this is the way that most international financial institutions have, um, have funded themselves. But there is a difference between this model, or IBRD, and the IDA model, um, which if we move to the next slide, will illustrate perhaps a little bit more clearly um, what has been uh, the traditional financing used, uh, financing approach used by IDA and how that has evolved over the last uh, uh, five, five or so years, as I, as I mentioned. Initially, IDA was set up to be funded exclusively by partner contributions. Um, as it became clear that uh, there were limits to how much uh, donors can put on the table, um, and that we needed to um, ramp up the volumes of financing, IDA started taking on what it calls concession of partner loans from its shareholders, again, from its members. Um, and then coupled that with uh, going to the capital markets to issue bonds and pooling all those resources effectively to provide a mix of grants and concession of financing, again, interest-free loans to its clients, plus, uh, providing now more and more um, non-concessional loans that are on similar terms to IBRD uh, financing to its IDA clients. Now, remember, a lot of a lot of uh, IDA clients, uh, the lower uh, lower income clients and middle income clients, have already started borrowing on uh, on commercial terms from the capital markets themselves and from other bilateral lenders. Um, so there is some capacity there for them to take on. Uh, non-concessional financing. Um, and by using this model, um, the expectation is that either recipient countries, either clients would also be able to tap another source of non-concessional financing to add to the development resources that they've, um, that they've tapped uh, or that they can tap uh, to, to finance their development needs. Um, so that explains Hopefully, um, and again, I, I, I acknowledge that I've crammed a lot into a couple of slides on, on the financing models for IBRD and IDA. But just to quickly show you as well in the next slide, um, what the volume of resources uh, are, are available in trust funds um, um, that are managed by um, IBRD and IDA. And, and you will see that, um, over the period uh, uh, of the last four years or so. Um, and here, when we refer to financial years, the, the finan this is a reference to the financial year uh, of the World Bank, which actually runs from July 1 uh, to June 30th of each, of each period. Um, we've seen um, a growth um, uh, in funds that we receive in trust funds from about $10 billion, $9.9 billion at the end of FY15 to about 10 and a half billion uh, at the end of FY19. So that would have been um, 
um, June, uh, at the end of June 30th, 2019, the numbers have increased a little bit um, um, uh, since then. Uh, but these are the latest figures that we were able to, um, to get. So there's a, it's a significant volume of resources that are made available by donors, again, targeted at specific sectors and specific geographic locations. The distinction between trust funds and IBRD and IDA in this respect is that IBRD and IDA, uh, their resources are not earmarked. Donors don't give resources to um, IDA and say that they can only be used in specific sectors or specific uh, geographical locations. And bondholders don't buy IBRD bonds and say that those bonds can only finance activities in specific sectors or specific um, um, uh, geographical locations. Trust funds do provide that sort of flexibility and they have been an attractive tool for donors who do want to prioritize the use of their funds in, in specific areas and um, for specific activities. So that's a, a, essentially a crash course in, um, in, um, in how we raise uh, funds. Um, and just quickly to give you a, a flavor for where those funds then go um, when, uh, when, when, um, when, when clients come and ask, you know, recipients come and ask us to, uh, to provide development financing. If we go to the next slide, I'll just quickly go through um, the, the sort of instruments that we use. Uh, to provide downstream uh, downstream financing um, out of the World Bank, uh, both out of IBRD and IDA financing, as well as out of um, uh, uh, trust funds that are held by uh, and managed by uh, by the bank. The three instruments that we do use uh, for direct, uh, what we call direct recipient executed financing, meaning for financing to, a pro, uh, to provide it to a recipient country for them to use um, are uh, a development, uh, development uh, policy financing. And by development policy financing here, we mean uh, financing provided to support uh, specific policy and institutional reforms that are being undertaken by the country. Um, so one example would be, let's say Liberia, um, looking to borrow funds to uh, finance um, a program related to uh, inclusive growth, um, where they want to support um, uh, they want to uh, uh, support, let's say, financial inclusion. Um, they will approach the bank to ask for resources um, that will go into their general budget, um, and we'll make I'll make a distinction between budget support and, and, and project financing shortly, that will go into their general budget with the understanding, with the, with, the, with the undertaking on their part, that they will undertake certain policy reforms or institutional reforms in, uh, as, part of, uh, as part of the receipt of those, of those resources. So it may be, um, if it's, we use an example I just gave of economic inclusion, they may uh, undertake to, to adopt a law um, to provide greater access to financing for underserved uh, communities, for women, for example. And, and, in, and as part of the financing package, they will get um, you know, $40 million, for example, um, that goes into the general budget uh, for that purpose. That's contrasted with um, what we call um, um, uh, project financing, right, and, under IPF, where the recipient is borrowing resources to go to finance a specific uh, activity um, uh, with specific expenditures or specific transactions. Um, topical example would be now um, financing COVID responses, uh, COVID responses to the epidemic where uh, the bank will provide um, financing for the, uh, for the acquisition of vaccines, um, for um, for the construction of storage facilities or supply chains uh, and so on. Um, and that's what would, would be covered under um, specific project financing <clears throat> under the IPF. And then the third um, uh, major instrument is what we call uh, uh, P4Rs, which a program, program for results financing where the, the World Bank will provide financing to support um, specific gov government programs where the resources provided are dispersed when specific results are met, 
by a, a, a client. So for an example would be, let's say water and sanitation in uh, water and sanitation P4R in Nigeria, where Nigeria is going to construct, let's say water points um, or um, uh, waste treatment facility. And once specific triggers, specific um, um, results are met in terms of number of water points constructed or number of sludge facilities um, uh, constructed, the bank releases funds against, against those results. Um, so those are the major, those are the three main instruments for direct uh, recipient executed financing. Um, we also do provide uh, guarantees, which um, are, um, uh, are used to, um, uh, uh, to uh, backstop financing that a, um, a recipient country may be getting from other sources. Uh, from either other bilateral lenders um, or from commercial creditors as well. <clears throat> and if we go, I believe, to the next slide, we'll, we should see um, um, uh, actually two slides down. Maybe let's um, let's skip this. Let's go to the guarantee. Let's go to the next one. I think which which does uh, provide an example of a of a, of a guarantee structure um, where you will see the typical. Uh, what a typical guarantee uh, will look like. Um, the private sector will lend, that's a little blue square on the left-hand side, will lend uh, resources to um, a, um, the government um, for a specific activity, usually infrastructure. Infrastructure tends to be one of the bigger, one of the areas where we use uh, guarantees uh, more often. And um, um, in turn, IBRD will um, provide a guarantee that in the event that the government is unable to pay the private sector, um, the uh, IBRD or IDA will, will, will make uh, the private sector lender whole. And in exchange, um, uh, and in, as part of the arrangement as well, the government will enter into an indemnity agreement with IBRD, so that, IBRD and IDA, so that in case one of uh, a payment needs to be made, um, under the guarantee, um, the World Bank can in turn look back to the government uh, to, uh, to reimburse the World Bank for the resources paid on to the private, uh, to the private sector, uh, to the private sector lender. So um, again, a, a very high level overview of, of what our financing arrangements uh, uh, both uh, on the inflow side, how we raise funds, um, and on the outflow side, how we provide those funds on to, uh, to our recipients. Um, happy to unpack this in more detail if um, there are questions um, to either myself or Professor Nogu on, 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 on any of what we've just covered, because um, I, I, as I said, we've, we've, we've crammed a lot into this, but we thought that this would be a useful way of um, of, of lay, setting the stage then for a more interactive discussion um, on, on how this uh, applies to African development um, and to the challenges that we have. So with that, um, can I hand back to you, Professor Nugu, um, to take it on from there? Sure, sure. Thanks, Professor Kira. Um, okay, so um, hopefully you guys can hear me better. Um, so having... Uh, looked at this, um, you know, consider it in a sense, the background, right? We have given you um, uh, what Professor Kera has called a crash course. Um, there are a couple of things I want you to keep in mind. So in addition to the financing instruments that we, um, you know, I, that the World Bank IDA or IBRD provides, um, they, these institutions also finance um, um, a lot of what we think of as advisory services or uh, studies like analytics. So um, sector studies that help the bank um, together with a client country understand where um, priorities lie, where there are gaps um, in terms of being able to most efficiently um, uh, develop the, the productive sectors of their economy, right? So you, you have um, those, um, those activities also financed. Um, when we talked about the, the bank, uh, IBRD or IDA as open institutions in terms of IO typologies, um, so meaning that, um, you know, 
any sovereign state can theoretically become a member of the of the World Bank. Um, that also allows the bank to command in some ways when compared to other international financial institutions like it. So in terms of the multilateral development lending institutions, it commands a, quite a broad convening power so that, um, you know, when we're thinking about African uh, sovereigns, for example, in terms of peer learning, uh, there can be also uh, learning in terms of peer learning. Uh, in terms of peer learning that can um, be of the sort of South-South, as it's called, uh, uh, flavor, right? So, because I know that Afronomics is, is again about this notion of perspective from the global South um, as defined, but their ability to convene and learn lessons from other regions of the world that may also have um, similar or experience, um, you know, sort of um, have similar economic experiences or structures um, that there could be peer learning, not just limited to the African continent, but, uh, but globally. So these are some of the, um, the roles that the World Bank plays. <clears throat> um, but now when we, when we get into this uh, last session of, the, of, of our time together, um, this is where we want to hear more from you. This is where, in the words of Professor Gathi, we uh, foreground um, local knowledge, um, we, you know, and, and this is where we want to hear from you. But uh, as I mentioned when we started about asking the question why, um, what the notion of African development is, what is it that Africa is trying to attain? I often ask this question is, you know, is Nairobi trying to look like New York? Um, is Lagos trying to look like Lisbon? What, what does it mean when we talk about African development and, and what is that vision? Is, is it the same as it was in 1960? Um, has it changed? Is there a vision for African development in the 21st century? So that's a question I'm gonna put out there um, for us to discuss. And in addition to that, because this is a legal group, the question then becomes, what are the legal frameworks for facilitating whatever vision that we are about to discuss, what are the visions for facilitating that, the legal frameworks, I mean, for facilitating it. And once we have sort of, um, in some ways, married those two, okay, here, here's what the vision should kind of more or less um, um, look like. This is what we, you know, African development should in some ways be um, approximating. And here are the kinds of legal frameworks for facilitating that. Um, and then where does the World Bank fit in? And in, in posing this question in this way, in cascading this question in this way, we haven't centered the World Bank in the context of this discussion. We have centered African development for the 21st century and then see uh, once that has been defined, what role the bank can play in the context of what we have provided to you, in the context of what we've talked to you about, the bounds, the basically the constituent documents that define the limits of the bank um, and its, its powers, its mandate, um, but also to give you some idea of the sources of financing and the instruments that are utilized within the context of that mandate. Um, one of the reasons why we ask the question why is that can these instruments be changed? They probably could be. Um, you know, can, um, can sources of financing, um, you know, can we engage at least interrogate the sources of financing and, and, and how it's utilized? Professor Kira spoke to the notion of trust funds um, as, as funds that are much more targeted to specific sectors or regions um, as opposed to um, the, the kitty for, for IDA or, um, for, or for IBRD, which is just you know, a lot more uh, universal. So it's not uh, in some ways, um, um, the, it's not targeted. You know, these are not uh, target, targeted fund, um, funding sources uh, for development as compared to trust funds or what we've called financial intermediary funds. Um, so we are posing the question to you now, we want to hear from you in terms of the development vision for, um, for, for Africa for the, first 21st for the 21st century. What are your thoughts on that and the legal frameworks for facilitating it before we get into the role of the bank um, within that context? So we're opening the floor to hear from everybody, not just students, but um, everybody um, who is participating uh, in this session.
And Vasura, perhaps you can uh, moderate uh, questions, comments, insights. All right. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Professor Anwabu and Professor Kiara. Um, I think it was a very insightful lecture on the institution, the legal structure of the World Bank, as well as the aspect of it and its limits and the financing aspect. I think we do have um, a couple of questions already in the chat room. Um, I think we'll have three to four questions first. And then after that, um, prof both professors, you can both then answer the questions. Um, I think we can first go with, um, I think we have, Jean, Luke, uh, Nico, and yeah, we have three questions in the chat room as well as Lizola. Perhaps we can go with Lizola first. Um, she put in a question in the chat room and then she can then ask the question and then we can proceed from them. And Nico, um, I think. Uh, hi, um, I'll just read the question. Um, so this is to either one of the presenters. Um, my question is, could you briefly explain um, the different methods of um, loan repayment and uh, maybe just touch on how the repayment clauses specifically for Africa, um, for African states as, are generally structured and then the second leg of my question is just, I wanted to ask whomever is going to answer uh, to just give their opinion on whether um, they feel that the overwhelming feeling um, among African academics and politicians that the repayment clauses are often too harsh, especially um, the consequences for default in comparison to the repayment clauses given to countries in the West. So whether they feel that, um, or in their opinion, whether this feeling is correct or whether it's, um, you know, not founded in any, anything solid. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, next we can have Jean Luke and then we can have Nico. Um, thank you. Uh, my question is in twofold. Um, like in the usual banking system, there is the essence of collateral use. Um, so the World Bank as an enormous institution, as we have seen like from the presentation, uh, which is uh, obviously outside the confines of the usual system, like what collateral securities that are used to enforce payment to various sovereigns that are lent World Bank loans. And uh, the second fold of the question is, um, what mechanism does the World Bank have in place to ensure maximum optimization of the funds allocated so as to mitigate misuse, or is this not within its purview? Thank you. Thank you, Nico. We can have Nico next. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. One is not really tied to Africa, and it's really maybe just for academic curiosity, but I also think it affects people's lives. Uh, what can it take Palestine to become a member of the World Bank? Uh, now, my question, and maybe really tied to Africa. So, um, like Africa, there's this Professor Ali Mazrui who has painted it as a confluence of mainly Islamic cultures, African cultures, and even Western cultures. So, like most African, some a good number of African countries really have Islam and they take it seriously. And then within uh, the Islamic capital market, we have some type of bonds known as sukuk. So there's no really interest. So I don't know, in the dealings of the World Bank, can it consider dealing in Islamic bonds with countries that are somehow Islamic or like predominantly with Muslim populations? Thank you, Nico. Um, I think any of the uh, speakers can answer the questions. Sure, thanks. Let me let me take let me uh, attempt to address the first the first two on the financing terms and 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 uh, um, maybe Professor Nogo can supplement as well. Um, so to um, to Lizolo's question on um, on on the repayment terms uh, for for loans. Uh, it, it, it's helpful perhaps to 
um, take a step back and, and um, remember that African nations are members of the World Bank and uh, both IBRD and IDA, just like the other, the, total, the totality of 187 other members uh, in total that we have uh, as, as, uh, as members of the institution. So we're a shareholder cooperative, right? Um, African countries don't get different terms from everybody else. Their payment clauses that, 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 that are in, in, in loans to African states are exactly the same clauses that will be in loans to any other country that is eligible for that specific type of loans. And there is, there is a distinction that's made based on, 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 um, uh, on uh, the GNI per capita that is used to determine whether uh, GNI per capita and credit worthiness that are used to determine whether a country is eligible to take loans from IBRD or to take loans from IDA. And in Africa, there are countries that take loans from IBRD, there are countries that take financing from IDA, but they get exactly the same terms as everybody else from the rest of the world. And the terms are extremely generous when compared to um, private sector commercial financing that those countries will take. Um, IDA will um, provide financing to its, uh, its clients, um, ranging from uh, uh, 25 years to 40 years in terms of maturity. And they're either no interest loans um, or they'll be outright grants, which they don't need to pay back. So the only question I guess here is, what are the terms that are apply to, the, uh, to those that are taking loans? And there's a repayment schedule that every country that takes loans from either the, either the IBRD or IDA will, will need to, to meet. Um, typically, um, um, repayments uh, every six months um, with an interest rate that reflects the very strong AAA credit rating that um, IBRD and IDA both have now. Um, the, for those familiar with the, the way credit rating agencies work, um, they will evaluate the ability of a bond issuer to repay the bonds that it uh, issues. And IBRD and IDA have the highest credit rating possible, which is AAA, meaning that they are then able to pay the lowest interest possible in the market because it's a risk metric. The stronger your credit rating is, the lower your risk is, so the less you'd have to pay in interest. And because these are shareholder cooperatives, we are not profit-taking institutions. The World Bank is not a profit-taking institution. It will pass on the benefit of that credit rating, that strong credit rating to its clients by charging a very low interest rate as well. It will add on a margin to cover administrative costs of doing business, but by and large, our client countries will benefit from the strong credit rating that the institutions have. So our borrowers receive very good terms as well. Now, if there's a failure to pay by a country, the bank, the World Bank does not, we do not sue our clients. We actually can't sue our clients. Um, what the, the biggest consequence of the failure of a country to repay a loan from the World Bank is that the World Bank will no longer provide any further financing to that country. And again, remember these are institutions, particularly Liberty, that were set up as banks. No commercial bank will lend into arrears. It will not provide financing to an entity that owes it money. Um, and in, and in, in much the same way, um, IBRD um, um, and, and IDA will not lend or provide financing out of their own resources to countries that are uh, in arrears to them. Now, there are other means for channeling resources to them that I, uh, that I, that I will get to, um, um, but not out of its own resources. So that's the largest consequence. Now, it's not inconsequential in and of itself because the moment a country does default in its loans to us, other lenders also will, particularly bilateral lenders, will, uh, will, will, will hit pause and become more uh, reluctant to provide financing as well, because we are what we call the lender of last resort. We will provide as institutions lending when others are less likely to do so. So if uh, a country is unable to repay the lender of last resort, then 
there are clearly concerns about its ability to continue to, to meet its obligations. So providing financing to them uh, has to be through other mechanisms. So hopefully that answers that, answers that, 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 that you know, the question that Liz will ask, but connected to that, is a um, question uh, from Professor Kara, yeah, if yeah. I may add to the issue of the lending eligibility, um, yeah. just very briefly. So, um, you know, we've talked about the articles of agreement. It's important to note that we also have policies and procedures that cascade from those. And one of those policies and it has to do with eligibility of, of, of um, countries, our member countries to borrow and, and the lending terms. And these lending terms have to do, we have IBRD lending terms, we have IDA lending terms. Again, going back to the articles, you notice where it talks about the IDA purpose having to do with making loans that bear have less heavily on the balance of payments. So the, the IDA's mission is to provide financing uh, in a way that is, not, that, does, that is not too burdensome on its member countries. Most of the African member countries are often IDA countries. And so their lending terms tend to actually be less burdensome than IBRD terms. So in our policies, we have, frankly, um, countries that are grant, what we call grant only countries. So that means the financing we provide to them are not repayable, right? And that is where, again, the bank distinguishes itself from being a bank. So we talked about, Professor Kara talked about how the bank, IBRD is in fact like a bank. And then of course, with IDA issuing bonds in, in many ways is also raising money like a bank. However, in terms of the lending terms with respect to either their countries that are grant, 100% grant only, and others that are, um, you know, a certain percentage, usually 50% credit, um, which is again, uh, concessional lending terms that, that are actually, uh, again, less burdensome than IBRD terms. So this is sort of to drive home the point that the bank is also not just the bank, is a development institution. So is development objective, going back to the language of the articles, the meet the development objective is a priority for the bank. Um, because as Professor Kiera says, it's not a profit-making institution. So I just wanted to add that in terms of um, our policies. Thank you very much, Professor Nogu, and that's, and that's, that's exactly right. Um, it's a pity we don't have enough time to get into, uh, to, to unpack that even further, because there are, as, as Professor Nogu says, there are criteria that are finely tuned um, with respect to what terms a country will get according to its risk of debt distress, according to its uh, GNI per capita, which is used as a metric for the strength of its, uh, of its economy. Um, again, if we have time, we could unpack that in more detail, but, but that's, that's right. So the repayment question really doesn't arise in the context of grants. Um, it really just is in the context, in the context of loans from IBRD and IDA. Um, on, uh, on the question of collateral, the bank as a matter of policy does not take collateral from its, uh, from its recipients. And again, this goes back to the point that, that Professor Mogu just made. We, we are a development institution. We may be a bank, we may be structured as a bank and finance ourselves as a bank, but we are a development institution as well. We do not demand collateral uh, from our, uh, from our um, uh, recipients. There is one exception which relates to um, what we call the negative pledge clause in, um, um, uh, in our financing agreements, which is not in and of itself um, uh, a bar to a recipient country providing collateral to others. What this clause does is say that if a recipient country pledges its assets and provides collateral to other lenders, then it should give us the same level of collateral so that we are treated as a par with that same, with the other, with the other lenders that have taken collateral from, from that recipient. Again, we don't want to be at a disadvantage when we have obligations ourselves to repay loans that we've taken on through bonds that we've issued. Um, we don't want to get a disadvantage to another, uh, to another lender. And so we'll have to be treated rateably if our client country does give um, um, collateral to a third party lender, All right? Um, very quickly on the question of, of, um, of Palestine, 
Um, well, it's 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 one of those long-standing, um, 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 particularly uh, difficult questions. But if you go back and we cast back to uh, the start and what Professor Nwogu drew your attention to. Remember that membership of the bank, of both IBRD and IDA is only open to members of the United Nations, sovereign members. Palestine is not considered a sovereign country. Um, it is a member, it, it has observer status at the United Nations, but it is not a full-fledged sovereign member of the United Nations until it does be become a sovereign state and is recognized as, as a sovereign state, it wouldn't be therefore eligible to become a member of the World Bank um, uh, on its own. Now that said, there are arrangements in place that do provide financing to the West Bank and Gaza through trust fund arrangements. If you remember, I talked a little bit about the trust funds and the trust funds as financing arrangements have greater flexibility with respect to where we can direct financing. We can use it to direct financing to West Bank and Gaza even though the West Bank is not a member. Because if you take a look back at the articles again, and we will we'll constantly go back to the articles of agreement of these institutions. Um, we can provide financing uh, where it is in the interests of the membership as a whole to provide financing to particular entities or to particular recipients. So we'll do that. We'll use that mechanism to provide financing to West Bank and Gaza. We'll also use trust funds to provide financing to countries that are in arrears to the World Bank, um, going back to the first question that was asked, so that even if a country has defaulted on its loans to IBRD and IDA and we cannot lend to them out of IBRD and IDA resources, donors can put money into a trust fund that can then be used to provide financing to countries and entities that would not otherwise be eligible to receive financing directly from the World Bank um, out of its own resources. Um, so hopefully that answers um, um, those questions. Just a quick, uh, quick, uh, quick response on on Sukuk. The bank actually does issue Sukuk bonds um, and has been exploring the provision of Sukuk financing um, um, to. Um, um, to Islamic countries. So that's something that's very much on the radar, but the bank is, is an issuer of, uh, of Sukuk bonds um, that, that are issued in accordance with the tenets of Islamic uh, financing law. I see a number of other questions have come in through the chat. So I, 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 I wonder um, whether... Um, so um, yeah, and while we while we look for the new some of the new questions, I think there was um, an outstanding question regarding optimization of bank financing. Mm -hmm. um, you know how how does the bank try to ensure this? Uh, again, it goes back to the notion of the bank as a development partner with its client countries. Um, the bank we talked about in terms of international organization typologies, it is a technical institution. So what, the, what that means is that staff of the bank are um, often experts in their sectors, in their field. And so when um, a client country develops whatever is deemed to be is a development strategy, uh, the bank also prepares in coordination with the member, uh, a country partnership framework. And that partnership framework basically um, based on prior studies, that looks at the sectors of the economy to figure out how to basically approximate to make the journey in terms of the development pathway that a country has selected, um, what sectors to prioritize and in what way. The bank then is able to allocate financing downstream to particular prioritized sectors in order to make sure that um, this is in, in keeping with the country partnership framework. And then within each of those sectors, projects are prepared. Projects are usually prepared based on studies as to the needs of, that, of the sector. And when it's prepared, it's prepared with a bank staff who is a technical expert in that area. Um, and so technical expert in that area, then supported by a number of other experts, including procurement and financial management experts who then mirror the client country's own staff 
experts in the preparation of a project. So all of that to ensure that when you, the bank is putting funds um, to a project, there is language that requires that the bank's funds are used diligently with due attention to economy. So all of that is to ensure that when, you know, um, there are works, goods, services purchased for the purpose of any project that they are procured competitively so that you ensure that you're getting the right price for your money and that these um, processes are monitored, reports are prepared to ensure that the bank gets um, the most for its dollar, for every single dollar it puts towards development. Because again, keeping in mind that this is not a profit-making institution, what it does want to do is to optimize its financing to bring about what the article talks about, the development objective or the development purpose. So ultimately, that ability to work with bank technical staff who are experts in the field and sometimes really global leaders in these sectors allows for projects to be prepared and as such financing to be provided in the most efficient manner. I don't know if that answers the question, but I wanted to address that. Okay, thank you so much for answering these questions. Um, we have three hands. We have Nico, uh, Wayne and Domini. I think the, those three can go and then we can have the questions that are asked in the chat room. And please do say your, your, you know, your law school if you're a student or what country you're from so that we get a sense of who you are as well. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I think, I think Vasari, you're speaking um, to me in terms of my hand up. I'm Nicola or Nick. I'm at the University of Advanced Rent in Johannesburg. Um, I just had two quick questions, trying to respond a little bit to the original question, which is what is the development we want in Africa and, and what institutions do we need to get there? My questions are related a little bit. The first is, um, Prof. Clara had said that when he was responding to a previous question that we all mem that all these countries are members like any other member. Um, but yet we're not, we're not, not every country is shareholders like every other shareholder, right? So, so, so I wanted to ask, what is the influence of the United States being such, so much the predominant shareholder? What type of influence does it have, not only formally, but also informally? So there's a lot of perception that um, US officials are consulted more, that, that they have uh, the bureaucrats over, overlap much more, that the presidents are, of the World Bank are always from the US. And so how do we make the World Bank look a lot more like the UN, I mean, the General Assembly, than it does like the Security Council, which would also maybe respond a bit to Nchiko's question about Palestine, because we know how influence works in both of those organizations. Um, and then my second question was just, um, again, when Prof. Clara was speaking about the type of funding, the different type ways that 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 um, states are funded, the, the DPF, the IPF, the P4R, and the only thing I could compare it to was how um, NGOs are funded in my country and or in many of our countries. And, and the criticism is that um, then it's not as malleable, it's not as flexible to the reality on the ground, and that there is a push for very measurable results, like building a school versus maybe immeasurable results like uh, political education and training. And so uh, we are put, so we're pushed in terms of what we do um, into plans that we don't necessarily believe are best. So how does that work at the country level and, and what is the World Bank doing to make sure that its funding is flexible to the reality on the ground? Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Um, I think Wayne can ask this question. Thank you, Vesora. Good day, everyone. And uh, well done to our two professors. I really enjoyed it. So captivating, a crash course, but then so much took in. Um, my name is Wayne from Namibia, and I studied at the University of Namibia. And I am currently doing my articles at one of the commercial law firms. Um, my first response is tied into what Nicola spoke about now, and that's based on what Professor Noku also said, uh, like the Africa we want, what is it that we want? And I think the first and foremost delineator of what we want is probably Agenda 2063. And then in terms of that, uh, especially Aspiration 1, it talks about 
the transformation of our economies and job creation. And under the rubric of the transformation of our economies, it mentions something very important. That's obviously assisting with the beneficiation of our mineral resources and then stuff like industrialization and manufacturing and manufacturing industries being upscaled. Now, obviously tied in with this is the fact that Africa's mineral endowment is definitely beyond dispute. And if we want to achieve the Africa we want, that is obviously an integrated, prosperous and peaceful Africa, and they were economically uh, uh, stable, I think money goes into that. And obviously financing goes into this. And that begs the question, is the, is the IDA and the IBRD willing to work with us and partner with us halfway in achieving these goals rather than just financing us through loans and grants, uh, but then over and above, then ma helping make Africa a self-sustaining continent and then financing domestic economies through building industries and building mechanisms for mineral beneficiation. Are these possibilities explored? Is there a possibility of us walking this route with uh, the World Bank? And then secondly, I have a question. And obviously we touched on this and the two professors spoke on this briefly. That's the lender borrower relationship. But on top of this, um, what Professor Chiara spoke about, and uh, that's the guarantee uh, in, in terms of the indirect financing transactions where uh, member countries can have the World Bank as a, as a guarantee for their private transactions. Um, is, does this include pledges and surety bonds as apparent in normal commercial transactions or, or are these included on the basis that it's not a profit-making institution? And then in the event of non-payment, for example, by third parties to which the World Bank has signed uh, or are given their guarantee, does that also not include, for example, sessions of loans and stuff like that? Or are these also included on the basis that the institution is not a profit-making institution? Thank you. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, I think we can have Dominique. Dominique can ask his questions. We are low. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Dominic Lovo. I am from the University of South Africa. I'm currently studying my master's in tax. Um, so I wanted to reflect on the question that you posed earlier, which is uh, the vision for Africa. And I feel like Wayne kind of really took the words out of my mouth. Dominic, I think you're muted. Okay, there you go. Okay. Um, I was saying, I don't know um, how long I was muted, but I was saying um, I'm from the University of South Africa and I'm currently doing my master's in text law. So um, I wanted to first reflect on the vision for Africa. I think for Africa, right, we're at a point where we've transitioned from um, the whole aspect of fighting for political freedom, I think. Of course, might, some might argue otherwise, and then moving to um, economic freedom, so to put it in that way. So that means trying to realize um, the agenda 2063. But then also do, uh, going in that direction, I would like to pose that question to say, what can be the role of the World Bank in increasing, um, or at least in making sure um, that the role of Africans themselves, or even private institutions, um, are in a position to take advantage of, of its role, rather, you know, not just uh, sovereign states. And for example, right, um, I think you might, you mentioned that there can be finance that is earmarked for specific activities. Um, for example, COVID-19 response. And at this moment, being in this space of trying to transform, you know, the economics in Africa, um, can a similar project or finance be directed in a similar manner, um, but increasing the role or the, uh, the role of African themselves and private institutions to such an extent that they can be responsible as well to, you know, um, improving infrastructure and all of these things that are connected to this agenda 2063. 
And the reason why I pose this question is because I think if we've noticed most countries in Africa, um, the World Bank has been very much active in trying to provide in, to provide the finance so that they can assist them in, in many ways, whether it's infrastructure development, et cetera. But then the unfortunate consequences of that is that um, the projects themselves, they haven't seemed to be working at least. I can maybe reflect from my own country in Zimbabwe, right, where I come from. We had a situation where I, if I'm not uh, incorrect, um, where the World Bank ended up closing that door. And I think it's because maybe we are, the focus is so much on this whole aspect of, okay, we can only provide finance to sovereign states. So can we just transform that maybe? I don't know if that question makes sense. Okay, um, thank you so much, Domini. Um, it would be great if any, if everyone, please just keep the questions short due to time and uh, the professors can answer the questions. Can we have the last round of questions? Okay, um, I guess we'll try and maybe we'll tag team this with Professor Nobu and um, um, and see if we can get through through all the questions. Um, let, let me start with with um, with Nicola's um, um, two comments uh, or questions. Um, the influence of of the U.S. Um, um, historically, that has certainly been the case. Um, um, the U.S. has historically been the largest shareholder in um, um, in the IBRD. Um, but its shareholding has declined over over time, um, uh, um, over the years, and it has also historically nominated the um, um, uh, president uh, of the World Bank Group, um, and until fairly recently, that nomination was usually unopposed. I think if you've paid attention to the way this has evolved over time, you'll have you'll have noted that. We've had, I think, in the last two last two presidential elections, we've had other nations nominating candidates, and have had to go through a round of um, of elections, uh, a lot, a round of rounds of voting, to ultimately um, uh, elect the president of the institution. So there is a change, um, a perceptible a perceptible change, I think, in the way the influence of other countries other members has grown in the institutions over time. Um, the model that is used to conduct business in the bank is one of consensus. Um, very little gets done in uh, the institution if there isn't broad consensus around a particular approach. Um, and consensus goes beyond just pure numerical voting. It means getting a, a significant uh, um, cohort of the membership to agree on a particular direction. And that, to some extent, in my view, I think, uh, blunts the influence of a dominant shareholder. We've seen in either replenishments um, that the U.S. has gone from being the largest donor to actually being the second or the third largest donor after the U.K. and after Japan. So that reflects, I think, the change in the global economy. China 20 years ago was not uh, uh, as large an economy as it is now. Now it's the second largest economy in the world. And we're beginning to see its influence in the institutions grow accordingly. So I think as, to put it simply, as the world goes, I think, so we see the World Bank institutions grow as well. And I think you will see shifts in, in, um, in, in, in the way um, um, op, uh, the way the, the, the institutions operate to reflect, I think, those changing, those changing dynamics. Um, a great deal has also been done in getting the voice of the developing countries um, to be heard at the board. The board has grown over the years to incorporate more uh, developed countries and give them seats at the table, both at both institutions. Um, so again, reflecting, I think, the, uh, the need for the institutions to take on board uh, more uh, input, certainly from its recipients, so that it's no longer just a, 
lend, it's not a donor dominated um, um, environment. Um, on the question of, of outputs and outcomes, it, it, this, this, this is something that we hear on a constant basis as well. Um, um, and and, and as, as it becomes clear that both us as an institution and donors as well expect to see um, value for the money that they're putting into these institutions is a greater focus as well, not just on outputs. I think you referred, uh, Nicola, to building more, um, uh, I, don't know, I don't remember what you called, what, what you referenced, but building more uh, physical structures. But we need to be able to measure more than just the number of physical structures that you can build. We need to measure the impact, uh, the outcomes that come from building these, these, um, these, these um, 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 physical structures. And there's more of a focus then on, on being able to, 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 to measure results, measure outcomes and measure impact. And it's all based effectively on, on the country-based model that these institutions use. We do not, as institutions, impose financing on a recipient. As Professor Nogu pointed out um, at, uh, in one of our early interventions, it's up to the country to put together a country partnership framework in consultation with the bank, and then agree on what development objectives, what development projects are of that country partnership framework the bank will finance for the country. Um, countries aren't obligated to take financing from the bank, um, but we would like to be able to target the financing to sectors that the country themselves identify as being sectors in which they would want uh, financial uh, intervention and, and assistance. And not just financial intervention and assistance, to a point that I think was asked with, uh, by, or made by Wayne. We are realizing more and more as well that you, providing financing in and of itself is not enough. And another point that Professor Nogu made about the bank providing technical assistance and what we call it, uh, analytical and advisory services. A lot of the bank's borrowers are not just looking for the money, they're looking for the technical know-how, the technical skills that come with the financing for a particular project. And I think, I personally think that that is the way of the future for the World Bank Group as institutions. What matters more and more, I think, and what is, is sought more and more by our recipients is technical know-how, technical capacity, because there are numerous other sources of financing that are available to a lot of these countries, but not necessarily the same um, 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 honest um, 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 technical advice and technical support um, that would come from uh, a shareholder cooperative such as the bank, um, of which these recipients are members. Um, maybe let me stop there and ask uh, uh, Professor Nwogu to, to respond to uh, the other question that, or the other portion of the question that, that Wayne asked on mineral resources, because this is, if she is, if she had time, she would tell you that this is something that's very close to her heart. And she will tell you a little bit, hopefully about the African mining legislation um, um, uh, initiative that, uh, that she has founded and led for a while. Thanks, Professor Kara. Um, and, you know, it's one of my joys in, in um, teaching, um, I find is, you know, hearing um, students create, not just question, but create. Why do I say that? Um, it's, the questioning is truly important but the constructing is the hard part. So it's important to really think through what you, you've re referenced as the Africa we want. When we're talking about Agenda 2063, Wayne, you know, you, you talked about this issue of, you know, the development of mineral resources to utilize that for the transformation of the continent. Um, you know, in addition to industrialization and, and all the other, um, you know, comments that, that you made, which is fantastic. And one of the key points of that um, when you mentioned Agenda 2063, I think two of you um, who have asked questions have referred to Agenda 2063, um, you know, in, in really presenting that as in, in some ways a template um, for the vision of um, African development in the 21st century. One of the underlying, on the, you know, pinning issues in there is, has to do with regionalization, is this notion of Africa as opposed to a state to state. So if you think about the fact that 
the bank is a cooperative of member states, right? Not sort of regional organizations or whatever else of member states. So in some ways that it deals one-on-one with, you know, with, you know, with each of these states. What we didn't mention is that we also um, haven't recognized this issue of regionalization and its, um, its connection to development pathways that the bank has made room for certain kinds of regional development financing. So I just want to put that on the table with respect to the notion of Agenda 263, the regional underpinning of that, and that the bank has made room for this notion of regional development financing, and perhaps it's something that does need to be increased if we're thinking about what roles can the bank play? Can we leverage this approach and increase the kind of budget that goes to some you know, certain levels of regional infrastructure, for example? Um, in terms of mineral beneficiation, as, 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 as Professor Guerra said, um, you know, the, the, the mining sector is dear to my heart. And, and I think actually that was the point of connection between me and Nsiko, who I believe Nsiko was a trainee of the AMLA, um, uh, the AMLA project in 2018 in Rwanda. Um, so it's, it's, it's a critical element. So when you, again, look at the articles, this is close reading, it's talking about the development of the productive sectors of the member states. And in Africa, one of the dominant, or in fact, the second dominant, the second largest employee um, in terms of sectors in Africa is mining. So first being agriculture, second being mining, right? So the ability to prioritize these areas, to make investments in these areas is critical. But also remember that when you look at those articles, the bank is not trying to stand or in a sense to supplant private sector investment, right? It only will come in in the places where, you know, um, there is not enough um, investment, uh, private investment in the area. Or what it wants to do is to facilitate the investment into that area. So for the most part in a lot of African sectors and um, countries, the mining sector has been deemed a bankable sector basically within the domain of the private sector for the most part, except for financing that goes to the enabling environment, the governance um, elements. And even at that is still, you know, very um, small change compared to funds that go into the private sector. So is this an area to be looked at? Absolutely. And I think that is something that we can absolutely engage when we're talking about what roles can the bank play? And one of the things that Professor Kira has said is that ultimately, each of these countries, the continent itself has to be at the lead when it comes to its own development. The bank cannot be in the lead, right? So they, the, the countries, Africa has to determine the agenda and decide where the bank fits in. Because as Professor Kara says, the bank does not impose its financing on countries. So to the extent that they are guided, that is a crucial um, element of it. But let me also point out in terms of what Nicola said in the beginning about in, you know, what is measurable as opposed to non-measurable. The bank has um, you know, gone into a number of what may be deemed non-measurable. When we talk about um, human capital, which is you know, another sort of major area in terms of the bank's focus, right? Um, about training. Um, capacity building, all of that goes to trying to provide financing, not just even if it goes to states, but using states as a mechanism for getting financing to civil society, to non-state apparatus, to um, you know, small um, you know, financing institutions that needs to provide further financing to small SMEs, for example. Um, but in a sense, working with governments to understand that these other stakeholders in society need to be financed, needs to be consulted. It's something also is a lesson the bank has learned from the 90s, right? The, 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 going back to Professor Kara's point that these institutions are evolving, which is, again, why we can get back to now that we're at the, at the hour to get back to this question of why why the bank does what it does, because if we understand it, we can change some of the elements of how the bank does certain things or how Africa does certain things in terms of its member states or in terms of its regional bodies, um, that ultimately, if we, can, if we can understand the motivations, some of those being political, 
we we cannot you know we we cannot um you know pretend that um these some of these decisions are not motivated motivated by political factors that um you know certain areas that governments want to engage in or not engage in is determined by political factors domestically for for those governments the bank has limits we talked about you know article um five and six of IDA and IBRD in terms of the political prohibitions of the bank, um, even as political factors push and pull at the bank's ability to do its work, that there is this language that limits what the bank can do in terms of the example you, you used was training into political activity training, right? Like, can the bank engage in political activity training when we have a political activity prohibitions in the articles of the bank? Right. So these are the kinds of things that we will need to sort of think through. What is governance as opposed to politics? Right. How do we train um, citizens on civic duties and rather than political activity? So the nuances we put to terms, the language we utilize, the semantics we utilize in understanding the details helps us to expand basically the interaction between the World Bank given its mandate, and Africa in terms of its vision for African development in the 21st century. So I think that's the only, um, you know, like, like Professor Kara said, this would take weeks. Um, last year, it took us 14, 14 weeks to teach our course. So um, ultimately, uh, these are just, you know, little tidbits, muscles of, of our own experience that we can share with you. Um, and I think I'll leave it there because we're at the hour. Thank you, Professor Nogu. Um, I was wondering if we can have another 10 minutes because we started a bit late, if that's okay with professors. Kara? Yes, absolutely, that's fine by me. Okay, um, then we're just gonna have the, the last round of questions. Um, I believe we have a hand for Joy Olavi and the few last questions in the chat room. Um, we'll have we'll have Lizola um, to then yeah Lizola to ask the last questions as well as yes just those three then it will be Lizola and the uh, Olavi and Joy the hands that are up uh, you guys can proceed with the questions. Sorry, that would just be Joy and um, Olavi that will be asking the questions then. Thank you so much. Um, hi. Um, thank you for the comments. Um, it's a conversation that's been really interesting. Um, my name is Joy Mbati. Um, I'm based um, in Kenya. And my um, con my question really has is sort of to piggyback off what we've been discussing around what exactly development means for Africa and how we can achieve um, those goals. Um, but, you know, in the course of, you know, using financing to achieve um, development agendas, unfortunately, you know, we have some, um, well, there has been some grievances in several African countries that the current, um, they, they might be current, um, states that maybe do not or rather would not be taking on those finances for um, good purposes. So, you know, the whole concept of odious debts has come around this. Um, should we, um, or rather, should there be mechanisms to prevent sort of using financing as a way for misappropriation of debt, um, of, of loans that, um, that do not align with the purposes um, of the country and of the citizens themselves. So I'm wondering if there's any mechanisms um, from both, you know, either bank um, towards reducing the possibility of taking loans or um, and not using them for the purposes of, you know, adequate development. Um, and if there are any um, mechanisms, you know, sort of like how that would interact, for instance, with tricky concepts like state sovereignty and the like. Uh, thank you so much, Joy, for the question. Um, Olavi, you can proceed with your question. Right. Uh, thank you. My name is Olavi Nangolo. I'm from Namibia. I'm a legal officer in the Ministry of Justice. 
uh, in response to the question as to what the vision for Africa is, uh, I think generally the vision is a decolonized Africa. That is a vision that we have. Uh, and now here comes my question. The, obviously the World Bank operates within the sphere of international law. I just wanted to solicit your views on uh, the school of thought that uh, says that uh, international economic law or international law is Eurocentric and continues the legacies of colonization of Africa. Just wanted to get your views on that. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question, Alavi. Um, I think any of the professors can answer the question. Um, so maybe I'll get started um, with, with, the, with the first question on, on the tension um, that comes with the issue of sovereignty and then, you know, ultimately, um, you know, whether there are avenues for um, ensuring, you know, I will sort of phrase it in this way that funds are used for purposes intended. Um, you know, um, ultimately, there are instruments that the bank utilizes for, for ensuring funds are used for purposes intended. This will sort of get us in the weeds in terms of our financing um, documents, um, how funds are transferred uh, to sovereigns, on what basis, and when uh, a sovereign who has borrowed from the bank can call on the funds borrowed. So the notion that funds are borrowed does not mean, um, in a sense, they are ultimately all transferred at the same time. In all, I mean, with respect to development policy financing, that's a little different because they meet certain criteria and the funds are disbursed to the general budget. But in terms of project financing, specific project financing, it's a little different. So it's on the basis of contracts signed, it's on the basis that they're, they're connections between um, the, the work uh, contracted for and the funds that are transferred. So these are, you know, uh, sort of nuances in terms of the ways in which uh, funds are monitored. When funds are used in ways um, not articulated within the, um, you know, four corners of the document, we have a process for declaring an expenditure ineligible. So even though a contract may have been signed for something, if it is not um, on the basis of activities actually articulated in the financing agreement, um, there is a process for recalling those funds um, if, um, if, if it is determined to be funds used for ineligible expenditure. So um, I think as Lizola mentioned, um, this is a two-way street. Um, the bank cannot do it all for an, uh, a government um, or a sovereign and should not, right? I mean, we, you know, some of you have talked about this notion of the decolonization of the continent um, you know, in various ways that you have put it, but that requires agency. That requires sovereigns being, again, in the lead in terms of their own development pathways. So the bank as an institution made up of member states who are sovereign necessarily, even though its purpose is technical in nature, necessarily will have tensions that are political in nature. And that political um, nature is embedded in the founding of the institution itself. That is for a different class, a different time where we can talk about the founding, basically the discussions um, of the Bretton Woods agreements and, and, and what led to the creation of the IMF and the World Bank. Um, but that's a different thing, but that is a tension embedded. And to some extent it actually should be, because why is that when you have the push and pull, the notion is that ultimately you can in some ways use the tension to approximate better and better sort of uh, uh, development um, strategies for, for the members, right? Given that they are cooperatives. So there's constancy in the push and pull of the needs of the minority, needs of the majority, whether we're talking about in terms of shares or we're talking about political majority and political minority. So, um, so that's, uh, that's one thing. Um, personal commentary. Just remember that um, 
Professor Kara says that everything we have said here does not represent the views of either the World Bank or American University or Washington College of Law. <laughs> These are personal um, ideas. So commentary on whether um, international economic law is Eurocentric. Frankly, the canon of academia, from my perspective, is Eurocentric. Um, some of that um, is some of that is not, um, in a sense, rocket science. And why do I say that? The pedagogical approach that created the the academy as as we know it, right? I mean, is Eurocentric. So ultimately, over time, what Professor Kara has talked about in terms of the evolution, right? That also starts to happen in academia. And we see that happening in academia. Um, you know, the, the very questioning of the foundational theories that we have, because they do not mirror our local experiences, it allows us to begin to develop different canonical approaches for, for the future different pedagogical approaches for teaching um, or diversifying. It's not to say that what we're trying to create is some sort of dominant African canon and then that applies to everybody. We're saying we have to diversify so that we understand that there are sort of different streams of reality as experienced by people. And as such, we need to bring all of those to the table in, in terms of decision-making. So, um, so to answer that question, Indeed it is, but I also see the reason why it is. But ultimately, as we continue to develop, you know, African, um, uh, in terms of, you know, the intelligentsia continues to develop, uh, you know, writing, um, you know, um, research, uh, I think that will start to diversify, you know, what we have deemed to be, you know, sort of the dominant canon in academia as a general matter, not just in international economic law. I'll leave the final words to Professor Kara <laughs> since I began. Well, let's just say that I'm glad that you took on that easy question on uh, on, on international economic, uh, the international economic law. Um, don't... Um, just want to acknowledge a couple of other comments and questions I think that were in the chat. Um, um, and, and these have all been, these have all been very good, very, very insightful questions. And, and to me just underscores uh, the point that I, I'll, I'll make now, which is the challenge we have on the continent and, and in response to one of Lizola's uh, comments, in my view is not, is, is, is not a lack of know-how. It's not a lack of skill. It's, it's not a lack of potential. Um, it essentially has boiled down to issues of governance, right? Um, Patrick makes the comment or asks the question, you know, we, uh, the continent has received financing in, in volume over the years. Um, what has been one of the bottlenecks in addressing the debt burden? And I think it boils down to governance. It really is about good governance. Um, and, um, and if we were able to, to address that, uh, through a variety of means, including capacity building, including technical uh, advisory, south, um, uh, advisory and assistance, south, south, uh, north, south, however we get it, and be able to, to, to leverage the skills that are clearly evident just from this last two hour discussion we've had. I think it would make a significant difference to, to achieving that the, the agenda 2063 that we do have. We've been great at exporting our capacity and our technical know-how uh, and our potential. But time we reverse that flow and make use of make use of our own homegrown skills, I think, to address the challenges we do have. Um, but this has been, I, I had wondered whether we'd have enough, you know, interaction for two hours, but clearly we could have used the, we could have used a lot more. But I found this to be particularly, uh, uh, particularly invigorating, and I appreciate, I think, all the very, the very insightful comments and questions that have come through. I guess back to uh, back to you. Is the source still there? They're muted. Okay. Uh, I think I don't know. Perhaps the source. Um, 
Well, I just want to welcome um, Jim Scotty to say a few closing words um, as we round up. Hi, everybody. Um, so sorry, uh, I didn't plan to be called upon. I was like all of you uh, here to learn. Uh, first, I want to thank, of course, professors Nogu and uh, Kiara for what I thought was a really fascinating presentation as well as uh, they're gener generously offering more than two hours of their time on a Saturday morning when they could be hanging out with their families and doing all the things that we plan to do on weekends. So uh, that was really amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, I was delighted to hear that it was actually the students who reached out to both of you. Uh, that's really impressive. Uh, uh, I, I think that both of them as uh, professors would, would um, uh, be committed to this because that all you students really inspire us. Uh, when Professor Kara spoke to me in the Indaba, he mentioned at the beginning, uh, we were reminiscing about how when we were students, we didn't have opportunities like this. So don't take this for granted uh, that uh, this kind of expertise is really important. And I just wanted to say two more things about that. First, I think, you know, one of the big ones, of course, is that uh, besides, you know, uh, not having opportunities like this, we don't have such uh, high level um, lawyers who are practicing, especially at the level what they are practicing on, on the transactional level, because they are discussing in detail the transactions that are involved and, and, and the kind of commitments that are made and uh, the entire sort of considerations in the documents that are uh, are implicated in, in all the transactions involved, but also the international organization uh, uh, part of it, uh, which is really critical to understanding uh, all the important questions. The third part of what all of you are asking, you know, about the knowledge systems and, 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 and how those are implicated in what uh, the bank and uh, the IMF and the IADA uh, do. So thank you very much uh, to both of the professors and thanks to the students for being so patient, having wonderful questions. You know, we know the bundles don't come cheap, you know, for your internet use. Uh, you could be making better use of those bundles. Um, I'm really super proud of all of you students for having uh, put together this academic forum. It's a really powerful, uh, statement by students across the continent uh, that you are willing to put time uh, to learn and to look for the resources yourselves. Uh, Professor Ohio, thank you very much, and Shiko and everybody else involved. You know, we are here simply to provide the platform and nothing more. Um, and I hope you continue to drive this and uh, make it an even more um, uh, successful initiative. Um, as you can see, our leading experts will be willing to speak with you um, because you have created something that's important and significant and that people are willing to invest their time and energy to, um, uh, to, to. Anyway, so thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate having been given a moment to say a word. Oh yeah, I, I think I should just conclude. Uh, maybe I can just like share like a small story. Actually, maybe the forum, the Afronomics Law Academic Forum would not have been what it is today without like my interaction with uh, Professor Neoma. So I met her uh, in Kigali 2018 uh, during the African Mining Legislation Workshop, which is the project she was talking about. And then uh, at around that time, the fourth biennial African International Economic Law Conference was happening in Nairobi at my university. And the people who are really behind it were Professor, Professor Zoyo, Gadi, Dr. Titilaya Debola, and then they sent out a call for applications. And then just as a student of struggling with would submit, and then there was a question that uh, Professor Neoma advised me on. And then I did my abstract um, based on that advice, and then uh, the paper was accepted. I presented the paper in the conference, 
And then uh, really after that, uh, I got introduced to diaphronomicslaw.org. At the time, we were mostly doing blogs alone. And then I contributed a couple of times. Then uh, professors uh, Oyo and uh, Olavisi approached me about this idea of an academic forum. And that's how now I ended up meeting Nicola and really like most of our members on this call to start this forum with people from almost uh, for now Eastern Africa, the Eastern African region and the Southern African region in total, I think 17 countries. And we are being established in West Africa as well. And as, th as time goes on, we are going to go to the Caribbean, Latin America and Asia. And we really hope that the impact will be really, really uh, big. Yeah, and just speaking for myself, I think it gives me a lot of hope because as students and even as a forum, we, we struggle to be anti-colonial on a continent where international economic law is really, really Eurocentric, as we said. And now like having practitioners who are saying, although with a lot of <laughs> caution that international law is Eurocentric, and they have like senior positions in an institution such as the World Bank really gives us a lot of hope. So thank you very much for taking your time to talk to us today. And we really hope that next time we send another invitation to you, we'll be really willing and happy to accept it again. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for being on the call.